It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yes, my name's written there. Nothing to do with me, my goodness, what I could attain. It's all to do with what Christ has done on our behalf, yeah? So that's really good. And what has he done on our behalf? He gave his life for us, didn't he? And that's what we're looking at tonight. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Okay, before we begin, we'll open in a word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord to undertake for us and, and to show us, open his word, reveal things to us. So let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us without witness and without hope. Lord, you've given witness by yourself. You've given witness by the prophets. And John the Baptist was a forerunner. But Lord, you've left us your word too so that we can read, we can understand, Lord, and take to our heart the things that you say. We do pray, Lord, that you do a work in our hearts. Lord, for we want people to see you in us, not just ourselves, Lord. We've got nothing to offer. You have everything to offer. We thank you for it. Open your word before us, Lord, as we look into it, that you would reveal things in our hearts and help us, Lord, to draw closer to you. Help us to appreciate the things that you've done on our behalf, Lord, that we might know you um, and, Lord, that we would draw close to you, that we would choose to walk with you day by day, that we might receive your blessings, that we might know your direction for us, that you would have your way in our hearts and lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we were looking at, in chapter 18, this is for Bible study, uh, that's uh, Sunday school, the adult Sunday school. We were looking how Jesus... Uh, was given this trial and it was a false trial. It continues now. He's been taken to the judgment hall and uh, though the people have seen in the garden, even in the garden when Jesus was arrested, they saw a miracle right before them. And when Peter saw what was about to take place, he threw his sword and he He had a slash at Malchus, servant of the high priest, and uh, I don't know if it was that Malchus ducked or what, but his ear was slashed off. And not in the book of John, but in, I think it was in the book of Luke, the other, uh, Matthew and Mark don't record it either, but Luke records that Jesus healed his ear. He touched his ear and healed it. Uh, But they saw this in front of them, but right Before that, when the captains of the guards and everything, they were coming up to arrest Jesus. Who was was leading them? Judas, Judas, okay, leading this group of people to come and get Jesus because he was the traitor uh, that Jesus had already spoken about that one of you is going to betray us. So he knows the beginning from the end. He knows what is going to take place in your life tomorrow. And uh, we don't. We can plan, but he knows what ultimately will take place because he is God in the flesh. Now, John, the book of John, right throughout the book, we've been seeing so many times that he is presented as the son of God. And uh, thanks for reminding us about that this morning. There's uh, one gospel who presents him as the king. There's another gospel who presents himself as the son of man. And uh, this one, John presents him as the son of God. <clears throat> so we'll start off uh, John chapter 19, verse 1. And Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Now, we know that Jesus went through, uh, he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. He was taken and he was tempted. He was tempted in such a way that 
he ate nothing for 40 days and 40 nights, and he afterward and hungered. Now, when you're on your weakest, that's the time when it's easier to give in to many things, right? It's not when you're strong, it's when you're weak. And that's the time when the devil tempted him. So, um, but the temptations didn't just stop there. There was many a temptation, many a trial, many a, um, a thing that, that would seek to discourage our Lord Jesus. He was often rejected. And what does the Bible say? In Isaiah, he was rejected of men, wasn't he? Um, it's in Isaiah 53, a beautiful chapter that tells us about Christ and the rejection and the suffering that he went through. <clears throat> he had soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put on his head. He was scourged, whipped, beaten. And the time uh, the Romans would use a whip that was known as a cat of nine tails which, uh, with nine uh, lengths of, of leather with bone or lead tied into the end of it. So when he was flogged, it would have ripped the skin open. So the Lord Jesus had his flesh ripped open. The Old Testament tells us uh, that basically he was unrecognisable. He was uh, whipped more than any man. So this crown of thorns was put on his head. They put on him a purple robe. Why the purple robe? What was it that we just learned about this morning that um, he was known as? King. Time and again, he's classed as a king. Where if you look back at chapter 18, you'll see, you'll see in verse 33, and Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of thee? Tell it thee of me. So uh, he was known as the king of the Jews. Then down in verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king then? Sorry, art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born. In other words, you said it, you got it right, you hit the nail on the head. Okay, that's what he's saying to him. Uh, so he's a king. <clears throat> that's why in chapter 19 and verse 3, uh, in verse 2, they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They were mocking him. He was mocked. <clears throat> verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. He knew there was no fault in this man. Pilate knew that this was no ordinary person and that he wasn't delivered for his own problems, his own sinful issues that he had, but rather it was because of the jealousy of the people. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Why a crown of thorns? It's because, again, it was mockery of him being a king. Okay, with the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. In other words, look at him. Here he is before you. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. You notice who was the leaders in that? It was the chief priests and the officers. That was the ones who were the ones who were crying out, crucify him. Because you can work up a crowd. Once you've got the crowd behind you, you can overrule governments, officials, because you've, you've got the whole multitude on your side. Now, if Pilate was the person he was supposed to be, and if he was a man above reproach who wanted a person to be judged not according to the masses, but according to truth, he would have said, you, you're the chief priest, you come here. Okay, guard, seize him, bring him up here. He would have been put on trial 
and said, you're trying to, to, to put this man who's done nothing amiss and who's no one's got anything that they can say uh, that he has done wrong. You're the one who's wanting him to die. You're going to die for wanting this unjust treatment. He could have done that and quieted the masses very quickly. But no, he didn't because he would rather please men. And you'll see that as, as the chapter unfolds. Crucify him, crucify him, Pilate saith unto them. Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Well, he did sort of try. Uh, he said, I don't find any fault in him. He's pure. He, he hasn't done anything wrong. But he was still uh, leaving it open to the whim of the people to uh, have their way. <clears throat> Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. That still was allowing them to do something where it was his decision. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. He made himself the son of God. If that's the law, then Jesus would have justly deserved to die unless, of course, one thing. He was the, who he said he was, the son of God. He made himself the son of God. Now listen to this next verse. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. In other words, he was afraid to start with, afraid of the masses because they wanted this man dead. But maybe afraid also because we learnt um, that they took Jesus to begin with to Annas. The reason they took Jesus to Annas was because he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, who was the high priest. And Caiaphas was a man a few uh, chapters back that we learnt. He said in chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it is expedient for you... Sorry, wrong verse. Uh, I got the wrong chapter there. Um, okay, it's... I've got it written down somewhere. Uh, I won't go to that one, but um, he's the one who says, you know nothing at all. Uh, don't you know that it's expedient for one man to die and not that the whole nation perish, so that the whole nation doesn't perish? He's the one who said that because he was the high priest and he was prophesying about what would happen, but prophesying that that would happen, we saw this morning, doesn't mean that he was a saved person or a person who was on Jesus' side. He said it because he was with the Pharisees wanting Jesus to perish and he was using it in that favour. And we also looked at a verse that uh, says that people came to Jesus and said, uh, or rather, they, they will say, cry out to God and say, but Lord... We prophesied in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name. And, and God will tell them, depart from me, ye cursed into the lake of fire. I never knew you. Right? And so we learn there that just because you prophesy something doesn't make you a Christian. Right? A person can tell the truth and be still a child of the devil. <laughs> right? So I want you to know that. And Caiaphas was such a man. He was a high priest who would rather have his position of glory before the people. That was the type of person he was. <clears throat> so Pilate heard this saying that he was the son of God. He said he, uh, he made himself the son of God and he was the more afraid. I think possibly when the chief priests and the soldiers went and arrested Jesus. And when Peter took his sword and cut off his ear, Malchus's ear, and when Jesus went and healed it, there was a bunch of people who saw that. 
right before that, when Jesus went out to the people and says, who are you after? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. They all fell back to the ground. Why? When he says, I am he, notice that the he is in italics numerous times. He's saying, I am. I'm the one you're after, but I am. He's saying that he is God because they knew who the I am of the Old Testament was. It was a very commonly known thing amongst the Jews. So maybe they fell back to the ground, they knew that this was a special man, that he had said he was the son of God, but then that's backed by the miracle that he just did by healing Malchus's ear. And I dare say that that word got back to Caiaphas, the high priest. Very, very likely. Not only that, but remember, his wife says, see that you have, uh, by the way, this is not in the book of John, it's in one of the other Gospels. His wife comes, uh, sorry, Pilate's wife comes to him and says, see that you have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. Now you can start to get the understanding of why Pilate feared. And especially when he hears hears this thing, that he says he's the son of God. Because things are starting to fall into place for Pilate. He's understanding that the works that he's hearing of that are done by this man is backed up by what he says, that he is who he says he is, the son of God, the king of the Jews. And Jesus tells him, my kingdom is not of this world. So everything's falling into place for Pilate to understand who Jesus is. That means he's at a position a position to make a choice, a decision. You know, people who are listening online or here, we have all got to come to this place where we make a choice what we do with the Lord Jesus. Jesus has paid for your sin and my sin on the cross. Sin, what's that? I'm good enough. Pray for Mary. That's her position. She knows the stories of the Bible. She understands that the Bible tells her she's a sinner, but she can't accept that because she hasn't murdered anybody or done anything bad. I said to her, so, okay, if Jesus was to stand right here with us, could you turn over to him, look over to him and say, I'm as good as you are, Jesus? Oh, no, not like that, she said. I said, so what you're saying is you know that you do have some sin. Well, yeah, but nothing bad. But then I was able to mention to her in the scriptures it tells us, if you or if anyone keeps the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That means if I have kept the law spotlessly, and yet I took that pen and I knew it wasn't mine. But it's only a pen. For crying out loud, it's a pen that you, you know. What makes a thief? Is it the size of the thing you took? Or is it the fact that you took something that didn't belong to you? When Jesus said don't murder, I mean, sorry, when the scriptures say don't murder, it means don't kill, right? It says thou shalt not kill. It's not talking about treading on an ant. It's talking about murder. But Jesus brings that standard up way higher. He says if you look on your brother to hate him in your heart, you've already murdered. If you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. His law is way up there way above our standard. We see a certain amount, we think if we've kept the law, we're squeaky clean. But God alone knows the heart. We might look squeaky clean to people, but God knows we are sinners. That's why he says, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says that Uh, All our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's the best we can do. That's the best we can do. (laughs) Don't talk about the worst we can do there. God knows our heart. 
That's why Jesus in, I think it's the end of John chapter 2, says that uh, this is when they wanted to make him king and all sorts of things like this. And, and he says, uh, but it says there that Jesus wouldn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in man. Even though they were for him, he knew what was in man, that is, in the heart. So going back to chapter 19, verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, that he made himself the son of God, he was the more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Look in Isaiah 53, verse 7. I'll read verse 6 as well. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our sin was put on Christ. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And that's what we've just been reading through. He was oppressed and afflicted. This is prophecy about what would happen to Christ. Yet he opened not his mouth. Ooh. It's so easy to open your mouth when people are against you, to retaliate, to get back at, but Jesus opened not his mouth. Here in the judgment hall, in verse 9, and went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Where do you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Pilate thought he had power to let Jesus go or to commit him to death. And in a physical sense, he did. The answer of Jesus in verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Ooh, what powerful words. And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. So he did try from that time. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Oh. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Pilate's got to make the hardest choice right now that he's ever made in his life. Do I stand up for what is truth and right? Or do I follow the whim of the people? You know what? Every one of us has got to make a decision like that through our lives. Whether we're going to stand up for what we know is right or whether we don't. But at this point, Pilate is facing a point I believe, a decision. Maybe he knew who Jesus was, but the people then would have to be, he'd have to turn his back on the people and he wouldn't be to them what he is at the moment. And so basically he'd have to be put into a place of humility rather than a place of power. And that held a lot of weight for this man at this time. <clears throat> he wanted to be Caesar's friend. What does the devil use to tempt us? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, sorry, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the what? Pride of life. The pride of life is what Pilate's being faced with right now. You know, there's the same things that the devil used against Jesus when he tempted him in the wilderness. <clears throat> when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Again, it comes up. Behold your what? Behold your king. 
But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Right, I believe the chief priests at this time had a, a decision to make too because they knew who Jesus was. They had seen the miracles. Remember, Jesus said, I can testify of myself. The Father testifies of me. John the Baptist preached of me. He said, but don't, don't receive testimony from man. He said, there's a stronger testimony than that. That is the works that I do. If you don't believe what we say, believe who I am because of the works. And that's what he said. We looked at that half a dozen weeks ago, 10 weeks ago, whatever. So <clears throat> that was one of the other uh, testimonies of the Lord Jesus and who he is was the works that he did because there was no other man that did these works other than him. The blind man said, why this is, this is to the people who were saying, how were you made whole? And he'd tell them, this Jesus told me to make clay and go and wash and, and I could see. And um, then they kept on asking him, but how were you made whole? And he says, I've already told you. Will you also be his disciples? <laughs> and um, he says, um, that, no, they said to him, well, we don't know where this man's from. We don't know who he is. You know? And the blind man said, why, this is a marvellous thing, that he's opened the eyes of, of one that was born blind and you don't know where he's from? <laughs> I thought, wow, you don't need to, to know a lot and be philosophical and everything else to be able to share Christ. Just say what's done in your heart. Share what Christ has done for you. He saved me from my sin. Okay, whether it's big or small is beside the point. Our sin, whether big or whether little, means that we deserve hellfire because God cannot have any place in heaven for sin. He is absolutely perfect, beyond reproach. He is holy in every way, in every thought. He is pure. He is totally without sin. So your little white lie, your little tiny taking a pen, whatever it might be, is enough to keep you from heaven because your sin is not allowed in heaven. But by the grace of God, he in his mercy, he paid for every one of your sins, every one of my sins. By God's grace, when I asked him to save me, he saved me. He promised that he that comes to Jesus, he will in no wise cast out. He's promised that he that believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I thank God for the salvation we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid for every one of our sins. <clears throat> we'll keep on moving. He says, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Verse 16. Then delivered he, to, uh, he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. The place of a skull. It was a known place of death. It was where criminals were tortured and hung on the cross. Here, it was not a new way of death, but it was a way of torture. Verse 18, where they crucified him and the two others with him. Actually, and two other with him. Is that other or others in your Bible? Others? Sorry? Others. Okay, I've got a mark through mine. I, don't, I didn't know if I crossed it out or I... There's no S. Okay. Okay, that's why I've crossed it out. Okay, there's a printing error where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. 
And Pilate wrote a, tit- a title and put it on a cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It's an interesting title because of the things that Pilate's just been through and the decisions he had to make and the things that were presented to him and what he knew of the Lord Jesus. He's written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then this title, sorry, this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said I'm the king of the Jews. This is the people who had wanted Jesus to die. But this is another strong reason why I think that Pilate knew that Jesus was who he said he was because he says, what I have written, I have written. That's final. I'm not changing it. Don't fall. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. What was that a sign of? When it had no seams, that was a garment fit for a king. No seams. Interesting. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Turn over to Psalm 22, 18. Psalm 22, 18. We'll see the prophecy. So many th- things were prophesied in, in the Old Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 is known as a messianic psalm. You look at verse 17 too. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. When Christ was on the cross, he was nailed with his hands through the, uh, sorry, nails through his hands and through his feet. The problem is it was done in such a way that when he would be hanging from his hands, it would be suffocating him. So he'd need to press on his feet to lift his weight to be able to breathe and take another gasp of of breath. But doing that, he'd be in excruciating pain from the, the nails piercing his feet. So it was done as a torture, but doing that also, you could number his bones. Yet the scriptures tell us also in the Old Testament prophecies about the death of Christ that no bone would be broken. And it says, uh, Psalm 22, 18, uh, sorry, 17, and I, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my, upon my vesture. So it was direct... Uh, prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ and here we see it coming to pass sorry chapter 19 I'll get my marker in here so I can flip a bit quicker verse 25 now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. He's getting John to look after his mother. And um, it's very interesting that Jesus here, he's... He's on the cross and yet he has time for someone else. His love doesn't dwine, like it doesn't disappear because he's in agony. But he's making sure that this woman would be looked after. And from that hour, that disciple, 
took her unto his own home. That disciple, John writes right throughout the book um, about this other disciple and things like that when he's talking about himself because he doesn't want to be in the limelight. He doesn't want to detract from the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to have that same focus as well. Uh, it's like John the Baptist as well, which is a different John. John the Baptist says there's got to be more of Christ and less of me. And uh, we ought to have that same attitude that we want Christ to shine through our life, to be used by God to shine forth his righteousness in us. <clears throat> After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I should have kept this over in Psalm, Psalm 69 and verse 21. There's a stack of Psalms that deal with uh, prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 69 verse 21 and it says, They gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So he said, I thirst. And that's that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, there was a set vessel, there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. I'm sure he didn't say it like that. It was probably more like, it is finished. Why did he say it was finished? Is it just because his life was over? No. There's something greater than that. He said it is finished because the payment for my sin was taken away. The payment for your sin had been completed. See, it's not you having to act really good in order to appease a holy God, but rather it is the payment for your sin on your behalf that had been completed at this time. Praise God. He's made salvation available for every person. The thief, the robber, same thing. The thief, the murderer, the child molester, the liar, lying tongue, everybody, a person who's hated their brother a person who's been a really good person. You know, you may be the best person in the world and still go to hell because you haven't trusted on Jesus' finished payment for you. It is Christ and him alone that can get you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. <clears throat> it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. It's Psalm 34 verse 20, and we will read it. Psalm 34 and verse 20, because it's good for us to see prophecy fulfilled. <clears throat> How many prophecies were fulfilled in the death of Christ is amazing. 34 and verse 20. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Talking about our Lord Jesus. So how was this accomplished? Well, it's because when they came up to him to break his legs, to quick enough, speed up his death, they found he was dead already, which is unusual for the time it took. But he had just suffered not only the crucifixion, he had suffered 
being the Lord of glory, he suffered the punishment from his heavenly Father against all of the sins collectively in the whole world over the whole of creation time, from the beginning to the end. When, you're, when, when you sinned, whether it's the last time you sinned or whatever, that sin was future from when Jesus died two, over 2,000 years ago. God knows the future from the beginning. God created time and he's outside of time. That's why one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day because the Lord's not bound by time as we are. It's hard for us to even try and think outside of time. It's like it blows your mind. But, but God is outside of time. He knew every one of my sins, not just up to the time I get saved, but for the rest of my life. He knew every one of my sins and he's paid for them all. Does that give me a license to sin? No, I, he doesn't want that for a believer. He wants us to be able to be uh, obedient unto him. And there's blessings that he gives because of obedience. <clears throat> so he was dead already and they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Look up 1 John 5, 6 and 8. It is there somewhere. 1 John 5, verses 6 and 8. We'll go 6 to 8. This is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. What's he talking about? He came by water and blood. In John chapter 3, we learnt about Jesus, we learnt about Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night and Jesus telling him, you must be born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. He says about two different births, flesh and spirit. He says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. But another verse there, it says, unless you are born of water and of the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, he's either introduced a third birth, there's not only flesh and spirit, there's water, flesh and spirit, or else, like I believe that it does speak about, because otherwise he's introduced another birth that he hasn't spoken about, um, the, the birth of water, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, the birth of the water is talking about the fleshly birth. It's talking about uh, in childbirth, the, the water of the mother's womb. That's why the waters break. It's time to head off to hospital quick or you'll, you might miss out. Um, it's a time of birth. The child is in a sack of water. It's an amazing thing as well. We haven't got time to go into that. Um, verse, sorry, I'm on the wrong chapter there. Uh, right, six to eight, uh, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. What's it talking about this blood again? Water and blood. Jesus came by water and blood. Okay, the water is talking about the fleshly birth. Jesus is, has come in the flesh. He was born of the mother's womb. Why the blood? Well, I'm told that the DNA line, the bloodline is passed down through the male. Well, Jesus had no earthly father. His father was God in heaven. So is that what it's talking about? I'm not positive, but I think that that's what it's talking about. So he that came by water and of the blood. <clears throat> so here we are. We're down to verse 38. And 
And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, interesting, Nicodemus, John chapter 3, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. That's a fair bit of spices to put on him, isn't it? Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. So it was very close to the place where he died. They put him in there quickly because the next day was the Jews' preparation day. What was it preparation for? Anyone know? Passover. Passover. That's right. And that was the reason we looked at this morning was uh, they, um, the, they didn't enter the judgment hall. This is the chief priests and, um, and the soldiers and everyone. They stayed out of the judgment hall because that would make them defiled for the preparation uh, this time, the Passover. And so they'd have to dip out. So they were more concerned with being clean in front of people than being clean from the heart before God. By the way, people, you don't need to be clean before people. What ultimately matters is if you're clean before God. And the only way to be clean before God is not to clean up your life, it's not to turn over a new leaf, but it's to trust the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, which we've looked at tonight. He did it for you. Did you know, sure, wicked men put him on the cross, but did you know that he allowed them to do that? He said, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to raise it again. Interestingly enough, that the scriptures talk about God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. But Jesus said he had power to lay it down and to raise his life. And then in another scripture, it talks about the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. These three are one. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is not a doctrine that was started by the Roman Catholic Church that is mentioned in one of their books, uh, in an encyclopedia type book written by Catholic people. It's not a doctrine that started there. It's a doctrine that started way back when the scriptures started. It's presented to us there. How that even when God made man, there's plurality. And many of the names of God, the Father, are the same names given to Jesus. Do you know that the Jehovah God is called the I Am, so is Jesus. Do you know that Jehovah is called the first and the last, you only have one first in a race and one last. He's the first and the last. You know, Jesus is also called the first and the last. Do you know Jehovah's called the Alpha and Omega? So is Jesus. You know, there's stacks of names, probably I would say a minimum of about 25 or 30 names given to Jehovah that is also given to the Lord Jesus. Jesus is our great God who came down in, in the form of a man to die for your sins. The big question is, have you received him? Have you received the God of the universe that he paid for your sin? Have you accepted that and said, thank you? Because he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Did you know that? Did you know eternal life hinges not on how good you are, but on what you've done with the Lord Jesus, who is God in the flesh. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you loved us, you loved your creation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you've 
offered us, that you've presented to us, and Lord, that we can freely accept. Lord, it's not a matter of how good we are. We know we fail your standard by such a long way. But yet, Lord, we are presented now as perfectly forgiven because that the payment has been completely made, paid in full. I thank you and praise you for it, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you might just help us to love you more, to understand the depths of this salvation. Help us to draw close to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.